Welcome everyone to our first talk for tonight. Um, it's called Won't Somebody Think of the Children? Examining COPPA Compliance at Scale. The speakers have asked to introduce themselves. Welcome. Hi everybody. How are you doing this morning? We are really excited to kick off this amazing village. Um, as you can see, this research is an interdisciplinary research with people from a variety of universities. Uh, we are from ICSI at UC Berkeley. And let me start with a direct question because I am Israeli, as you hear from my accent. Who here brought a burner to DEF CON? Not their personal phone. Great. Who here is not using Android because of security issues? Okay, we have a number of people. Well, the issue is our phones are, of course, um, they have very sensitive information. Apps are collecting that information. Through those permissions, we often see at the Play Store and the Android system, we only know what they may request and may collect. We don't actually know what is happening in reality, what information is being collected, and more importantly, who is getting that information. So my colleague here, Primal, uh, will kick us off and explain what we are doing in this privacy audit, which is a collaboration between a bunch of hacker security researchers from ICSI and me. I'm a doctoral law candidate at Berkeley Law and a CLTC grantee. Thanks, Amit. Um, I guess everyone can hear me. Uh, so I'm Primal. Um, I'm a postdoc researcher in uh, UC Berkeley and ICSI. Um, so as, as Amit, uh, kind of uh, set the stage why we need this. Um, well, the, the simple question is that once you give permission to an Android application, that's it. You don't have any idea, you know, how the application is going to exercise that permission or who else is getting that information. So to answer that question, uh, we developed a uh, dynamic analysis platform where we can see uh, how exactly these applications are using those resources and who else is getting these uh, resources as well. Well, it's no longer a secret that whenever an application access your data, it's going to share the data with gazillion other third party users. So we want to understand that ecosystem. And then the core use case uh, of this uh, platform is to actually see how uh, these mobile applications are compliant with the, the regulations. Uh, COPA, GDPR, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, Etc. So, uh, how, how the applications are actually uh, complying with these regulations. So, the instrumentation framework has two major components. The, the first one is we actually have a custom built Android 6 uh, where we can monitor whenever an application access any sensitive resource and also all the surrounding uh, contextual information uh, with that uh, permission request. We also have a tool called Luma which is pretty much like a VPN monitoring Android where we can track all the network traffic originate, uh, originate from a, a given application and its content as well. So uh, we can see whenever an application access resource, uh, a given resource, we can also see who else is getting that resource as well. So using that platform, we built an, an automated pipeline. Uh, we scrape Android Play Store to download all the most popular apps uh, under each different category. And then we also have an uh, Android exercise monkey who runs this application for 10 minutes. Uh, and then the platform will try to get all the uh, uh, data on the resource access and then the network sharing. So, uh, and then right now we can actually execute uh, 1,000 applications per day. Uh, and we have uh, already analyzed close to 80,000 um, so far. So um, technically speaking, we can analyze, we can see every uh, single uh, sensitive resource in Android. But for the purpose of this talk, uh, we are just going to focus on a subset of it. Uh, and then we are going to categorize into two categories. The one is just personal information, uh, like your contact details, your location details, or even your Wi-Fi wi uh, wi route information which could also be uh, you know, tr traced back to you. And then all the different persistent identifiers that Android provides uh, for third party applications, uh, like IMI, uh, MAC address, Android ID, uh, or even uh, the Google service framework IDs. So that's uh, like a very high level overview of the instrumentation. Uh, let's uh, hear the legal side of it. So what are we doing with all of this information? 
We started looking at compliance. Our infrastructure is applicable also to GDPR and the upcoming privacy regulation in California. If you heard about it, it's coming in 2020. But we basically started with, the, with COPA, with the Children Online Privacy Protection Act. And the reason we chose COPA is because COPA has very strict definitions on what you are allowed to collect from children under 13. What kind of disclosures you need to, need to give to the parents? What kind of privacy protections? And COPA defines personal information very broadly. So this, of course, includes contact information like email and find geolocation, but it also includes persistent identifiers that are defined broadly. Basically, everything that could be used to create a profile on children. So because our infrastructure is basically looking at how SDKs and third parties are getting various kinds of persistent identifiers. We chose COPA as our first case study, but we are actually expanding this approach. So a word about COPA. COPA is designed to basically regulate the way online service providers, including mobile apps, are collecting, using, and disclosing personal information of children under 13. Now, COPPA specifically prohibits behavioral advertising and collection of persistent identifiers without a very, very strange type of verifiable parental consent. And when I speak about a strange regime, I'm talking about you actually need to verify that the parent consented to the collection of the various type of information. So you need to get the credit card details from the parent or their address or call and talk with them on the phone. We will, we will see in one minute why this issue of consent matters. Now, COPA also requires that you will actually have in place reasonable security measures. As we will show, that's not exactly being, being the reality in practice. A lot of apps don't have even the basic of basic reasonable protection security measures. Okay, now COPA also has teeth. Although it's still not clear if we have a private right of action, so whether individual can go to court and sue a company for vi violating COPA, that is still kind of emerging right now with a bunch of new class actions. The FTC can go after companies for violating COPA and state eternal journals. And each violation, and you will see the potential violations, the amount that we are talking about them here today, is up to $40,000, yes, per violation. And maybe you remember that from that episode in Silicon Valley where Dinesh freaked out. So, we actually see how FT the FTC is bringing settlements under COPPA, but remember the FTC has limited resources, unfortunately. So, it's interesting to kind of compare the different settlements that were actually uh, brought by the FTC under COPPA and what is actually happening in reality. So one very important issue, especially for our paper and our talk, is who is actually being enforced under COPPA? So we have three main categories. First, we have the actual commercial website or online services, including mobile apps, that are directed to children. So if you have an app and you're teaching one to three or ABC, and according to the total circumstances, this is directed to children under 13 because you have cartoons or simple language, etc. COPA applies on you, whether you're thinking you're directed to children or not. This is a, a, a flexible test that the FTC applies. Then we, we actually have our operators, okay, of general audience services. So think about something like Yelp. Yelp is not directed only to children, but if that online service provider has direct actual knowledge that there is a child interacting with the service, maybe because theoretically and unrelated to any settlement that was reached with Yelp, they collected date births and they knew the person, the child was under 13, then COPPA would apply only also with respect to general audience services. And most importantly, for our talk, COPA also applies for third parties. So our ad net networks and the SDK and basically everybody that wants to get 
money and basically monetize our information, it also applies to those services if they have actual knowledge that their service is being used in a child-directed other service. So think about an SDK or an ad network implemented in a child-directed app. That is important because the FTC actually brought action against Inmobi, which is this kind of ad network or third party. So what are we focusing on? We are focusing on almost 6,000 of the most popular apps on Android designed for families, Google Play Store. And the key issue here is, as you see here, there are apps Every app that is listed to design for family, in design for families at Google Play Store, actually represented to, to Google that their service, their app is child directed. In fact, if you're not child directed, you have no place on design for families. They also represented to Google that they're compliant with COPPA. Okay, remember that when we get to the results. So, as I, as I told you, almost 6,000 of the most popular apps aren't designed for families. What did we see? Not sure that you're going to be surprised. 57% in, percent in potential violation, more than the majority. Out of this, 4.8 are actually collecting personal information, so find geolocation, emails, and the phone number, yes. Then we have 39% collecting non-resettable persistent identifiers. 19, potentially non-compliant SDK. What I mean by that is 90% of those apps are actually implementing in their app a service that in their terms of use said there shouldn't be a part of a child-directed service. So the, the app network said in their terms of use, you cannot use our service in child-directed services, and yet in 90%, of our cluster, the app, the app developers implemented those SDKs. And then we have failure to take basic security measures, basic TLS. So I'm just gonna run through it because we talked about it. The main idea here is how do we know that no consent was obtained from the parent? Because we have our monkey. Our monkey just clicks. It's not a real human being. I think the monkey can bypass the consent, also a child could do that. So that's how we know that no verifiable parental consent was obtained. And we talked about the different uh, violations that we found. This is just a, co a uh, showcase of on in which type of uh, app developers that happened. So Time Lab here, they're a real big compliant. 1.9 collect actual content information. Another interesting issue is that like, Google have this idea that they created a, reset, a resettable Android ID so that you can reset it. But what we see is the developers are actually undermining that by collecting that information, the Android ID that is supposed to be resettable, with a persistent identifier that is not resettable, thereby undermining the whole idea of the Android ID. 39% of that, of our cluster, that's billions of downloads are doing that. And let me skip right in and get to a bit of the crypto. So, Primal. Um, yeah, before getting into the crypto, I'm just going to skim over. Uh, since we mentioned that not only application, the third party services are also, uh, you know, they, have, they are subject to the COPA law as well. So, uh, different third party services have taken different measures to make sure that they are not in the crosshair. So, here is an example. In, if, if, you are in a sub, if you are a subscriber of Unity, then uh, there is a stick box that in, when you register, you say that, you know, uh, I'm actually giving you data that col that's likely collected uh, from, from a kid's target application. So, and then in the actual uh, network flow, there is also a flag that you can say that uh, I am sending data from a kid's application. But what we found out is that 84% of the time, applications are not setting it correctly. So the reason why they have this flag is like they want to treat the data that they are getting from kids' application differently because there are there are certain restrictions. But if you not set the flag correctly, then they are likely to uh, not the, not treat the data proper way. So in violation of COPA, and then there are other services that they don't have any flags. They just outright say do not use this service. So for an example, uh, Crashlytics. 
uh, it's a very popular third party service among mobile applications, say that if you are a developer of a targeted application, do not use this service. But <coughs> unfortunately, and <coughs> not so surprisingly, 19% 19, 19 of the applications, they shared very sensitive data with non-COPA compliant services. And then if you actually uh, calculate the number of affected users against each SDK, it's hundreds of millions of users. So it's not a significant, uh, it's not a like negligible portion. Um, and then we mentioned that uh, an important clause in COPA is that you know you have to take proper security measures. But what we found out is that 40% of all the network flows that we see they didn't even bother using as a TLS. That's most of the time just it's a standard library in Android. Uh, you don't have to do much. Uh, they didn't they didn't bother using. It. Um, so. Uh, after the after actually doing uh, doing the full uh, analysis, we found that there are there are a few cases where we see the application accessing certain resources like location, IMI numbers, but we don't see them sharing over the network. Well, you know the the first intuition might be you know for once they are actually trying to be privacy conscious. Well, and then you know after years of trying to analyze the application, we we knew that it's not going to be the case. There's something fishy going on. So. We actually uh, filtered all those applications, and then we started manually analyzing this. So we we actually came uh, came across quite a few in very interesting use cases. Uh, I, I just picked three for under no particular order. So so there is this application when we uh, started uh, and manually going through the uh, network flows. There is actually a variable called location, uh, but and there is a value. Uh, but the value is the, it's not like core fine uh, location data. Well, then we tried with you know uh, base 64 uh, decoding, nothing came out, and then we decompiled the code, and then we saw that they get the original location data, and then they XO twice with two strings. So we thought maybe you know uh, they have like a one-time pad, or uh, they have like they are probably creating this value of the file. What we found out is that, so they have two hard-coded strings, and then encryption key, encryption key, encryption key, and then it's not enough, startup, startup, startup. Well, startup is at the actual SDK that's doing this. Uh, if you search it, it's actually a quite popular uh, third-party uh, ad service, uh, and then you get the, uh, the, the raw location. Um, and some people were actually encrypting it. You know, they were using AES, but unfortunately, they have the key and then the IV both hard coded in the app, uh, code itself. So, well, it was it was a well, it was a one extra step, but uh, we just had to make sure that uh, we are scanning it. So, the, the one uh, in the last uh, use case is that. So, here's a, a network flow that we detected on an application. So, if you can see, this is the IMI number. And this is the Android ID that Amit was talking about, like the resetable. And there are a bunch of uh, data, chunk of data in between. And then as you can see, uh, these are repeating. So there's actually three unique values and then just repeating itself. What we found out is that, uh, <coughs> so they are sending the row IMI number. And this is in one network flow. Uh, and then they are also sending the MD5 of the IMI number, and then SHA1 of the IMI number, SHA2536. And then these are all same values, it's repeating. And they are doing the same thing for Android ID as well. But the only difference is that in the Android ID, the values are not repeating. You have the MD5 and then a different value, SHA1 and a different value. So what they are doing is that so they, they take the MD5 of the original value and then, then convert it to uppercase and then take the MD5 again. So if you take the uppercase of a number, it's still the same. So that's why you are seeing the repeating value. But for the Android ID, well, if you take the uppercase, it's a different value, so you get a different value. Well, for the more, we've been looking at this for months, we still don't know why they're doing it, so if you have a better idea, we can talk over after, <laughs> after the talk. Um, so, and then, uh, if you, there are many more interesting use cases in our official blog post, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about it. Well, the bottom line is 57% of the time, they are 
potentially violating at least one of those clauses. Great. So, by the way, COPA has a safe harbor regime that allows private company, private organization to certify a service as COPA compliant. This is supposed to make enforcement easier. What we saw is that the practices in apps that are certified as COPA compliant under the safe harbor regimes are actually no different than others. So this is a, a, a bigger picture kind of finding with respect to the applicability and the effectiveness of those safe harbor regimes. And by the way, we got to the news. Uh, it was fun. Uh, and we are happy to chat about it more. Uh, we do have some more findings with respect to something we are, co we are calling mixed audience. So one of the problem is that apps like this are categorized under Google Play Store as mixed audience, not primarily directed to children. So some developers, after we were on the news, they claimed, like Tiny Lab, oh, we are not really directed to children. We see, our, we see teens and um, adults using our services. And as you can see, this is clearly not child directed at all. And what about other examples? So overall, we found that more than the majority of our cluster, 51% of the apps in our, the most popular apps in our research are actually family friendly, not primarily directed to children. And this includes this adult oriented app and this. And what about this? Clearly not directed to children app. So there is also an abuse of the design for families mixed audience regime. And I want to close it uh, with a bunch of recommendations and what we are suggesting. Just some findings from our research. We have a full paper. It was published in PETS. It's online. It's accessible to everybody. We have a blog post. And actually, all of the information is on our blog app sensors. You can look whichever app that you want and get exactly what they're collecting. And we are encouraging you to do that. So what we're recommending is, in this scenario, be Jared. Don't be Donesh. Developers, use compliant SDKs, right? COPA is a big deal. You don't want to be the, you don't want to have the FTC knocking at your door. So read the terms of the SDK. Use the flags, okay? SDK providers, come on, enforce your terms of use. That is not as hard. Platforms, Google, Amazon. Apple, you have a lot to do here. You have a role to play here. Enforce your own terms of use. And I'm happy to say that we are actually talking with Google and trying to help as much as possible. And users, of course, privacy aware awareness, parents, go on app census, look at what is being done. And finally, for you, everybody here, we need more privacy auditors. We need your help. Join the privacy auditing efforts. This is one just cool research. We would love to see more and more efforts into at scale dynamic analysis tools. Please help us help everybody else. Here are some links. You can follow up with us. Let's um, open up the question. But just a heads up, if you do end up doing this, you might get letters like we got from ad networks. Don't get too excited. That's part of the deal. When you get a legal threat letter, you know you made it as an academic. <laughs> okay, let's open it up for questions. <laughs>